The Dukes of Hazzard was one of the biggest hits of the early 1980s. It debuted in 1979 but ran until 1985. This video is about goofs on the Dukes of Hazzard. This is a compilation of all my Dukes Goose videos so far with updates on new stuff y'all pointed out in the comments and some fixing of my own goose. Like every other kid that grew up in the 70s and 80s, The Dukes of Hazzard was one of my favorite shows. The show ran from 79 to 85 for 7 seasons and 147 episodes. Now I have to get this off my chest right off the bat before we start. The biggest goof of the show they ever made, in my opinion, was when the decision was made to move the series production from Georgia to California. Sure, it was still a fun show, I'll admit that, but it really lost that feeling of authenticity that it had with the original episodes. Okay, in the very first episode, Cooter steals a police car and is being chased by the Dukes. But as he drives by, it is a police officer in the car, and you can tell by the star that's on his shoulder. Now, they didn't really reveal the fact that it was Cooter until Cooter wrecks the car. Quick side note, I think old Cooter was channeling another classic TV country boy, Ernest T. same box matches. To you and you, it's me, it's me, it's Ernest T. <laughs> this next scene could have been meant for a new Twilight Zone revival because either the Dukes drove so fast they went back in time and passed themselves, or they went into a parallel dimension, or maybe the crew just left an extra General Lee lying around. In the second season episode, The Ghost of General Lee, Roscoe thinks the Dukes drowned along with the General, so the Dukes pretend to be ghosts and ram Roscoe's patrol car. Now notice the general looks to have sustained some damage even to the point of the hood popping open. But then in the next scene the general pulls away without a scratch. Of course I've always suspected the general was able to heal itself. Of course we know that in real life every time the general jumped the Dodge Charger to play the general was dead. Even though as far as we saw the Dukes just drove on like nothing ever happened. And you wonder why 69 Dodge Chargers are so hard to find these days. If you're a big Dukes of Hazzard fan like me, you've probably seen this jump a million times. I have to be honest, I never noticed this before until I read it on the IMDB. There, there's a camera attached to the general on your left. Thanks to the camera, we got this cool shot of the general in the air. In the second season episode, Hazard Connection, something doesn't seem quite right when Bo punches the bad guy in this scene. It looks like the bad guy is reacting before Bo even gets anywhere near his face. Of course, maybe he was just squeamish. Yeah, I think the threat of Bo's mighty punch was just enough to scare the man into reacting way before the punch. That's that's what it was. I'm starting to think that Hazard County is near the Bermuda Triangle. I mean, check out this time jump. See this fellow running up to meet his girl? Well, here he is again pulling up in a car. Susie! The next explosive goof occurs on the episode The Runaway. Now this is the episode where the Duke boys run Daisy's Roadrunner right off a cliff. Now you know, I always like that car better than a Jeep. Now, as you can see, the Dukes are clearly alone in the car, which looks to be in the studio. Oh, before I continue on this one, quite a few of you all pointed out the last time I posted this on the Dukes Goose video that it looks like someone left a drinking cup on Daisy's hood towards the far right on the bottom. So I guess we should believe the Dukes were really driving real, real slow, or they super glued that cup to the hood. Now, I always wondered, why do they ever sh shoot those outdoor scenes indoors on these TV shows? Well, anyways, just as the Duke boys jump out of the vehicle, suddenly a mysterious figure pops out of nowhere. Now, I sure hope he was a stuntman and knew what he was doing, because, you know, that car just goes right off the cliff and <laughs> into a big, fiery explosion. In the second season on the episode Follow That Still, Roscoe P. Coltrane is trying to pull over the Duke boys again who are driving a tank this time. A lot of viewers corrected me on this one. I, uh, I incorrectly referred to this vehicle as a tank. Apparently it's an armored personnel carrier. But of course that kind of messes me up a little bit when I mentioned the haunted tank bit a, a little bit later. 
But what will you see? Now Roscoe wrecks his patrol car, of course, which looks to have lost its police siren. But then it mysteriously reappears the next second. You reckon we can chalk this one up to the Bermuda Triangle theory I have again? Now in the same episode, toward the end, the Dukes are in the tank again, and they find the illegal cigarettes inside, which violates their probation. So they start throwing out the boxes of cigarettes until the brakes on the tank give out, and they all have to jump out to safety as that tank heads towards the boar's nest. But there must have been a ghost inside that tank as the boxes are still being thrown out of the tank right before the tank slams into the boar's nest and after, of course, everybody's already jumped out of the tank. Of course, I do have a theory. If you've ever read the OGI combat comics, then you might be familiar with the haunted tank, which during World War II was inhabited by the ghost of Civil War General Stewart. He helped his descendant, Jeb Stewart, fight the Germans in that war, and proven that the ghost of General Stewart did in fact come in contact with the Dukes, there's an episode of the Batman Brave and Bold where the tank uh, not only does a Dukes of Hazzard style jump, but also made the Dixie sound, just like the sound of the Dukes General Lee's horn. The next goof involves a car that changes models in the middle of a stunt. Now, in this scene from the third season episode, Carnival of Thrills, we see Bo about to do a practice jump for a show he's joined. Now, I'm not quite sure about the models of the car he's supposed to be driving, but according to IMDB, he starts his jump in a Plymouth satellite. <laughs> then, as he gets closer to the ramp, the car turns into a Plymouth Fury. And then once it lands, it becomes a Ford Grand Torino. As he's driving back, it morphs yet again. Now if you had a hard time telling that the car was changing, just keep your eyes on the front of the grill, rewind it, and, and look at it again. Uh, now can you imagine if they switched to General Lee like that during the middle of a jump? I mean, what if it turned into a Mustang headed for the jump, and then in the air, God forbid, it turned into a Pinto before it hit the ground? It would explode it into a fiery ball of, well, fire. I do have a theory, though. It could be that Bo had indeed made the first contact with alien life uh, that we know as the Transformers. Now, in the third season episode, Mrs. Roscoe P. Cole Train, the Dukes get ran off the road by some crooks. And the general takes a lot of damage, but by the middle of the episode, the general appears to have healed itself. When the dukes pull up to the farm, it looks perfect. Now it only looks beaten and battered again a few scenes later. Now we know the general can heal itself, but can it make itself look hurt on command as well? I just don't know. Let's go forward in time to season 5 in 1982. Now this is back when Bo and Luke left for just a little bit. And then uh, Coy and Vance came in. How did Bo and Luke leave Hazard County to join the NASCAR circuit when they were on parole? Uh, you may not be on probation like your jailbird cousins are, but I tell you, a Duke's a Duke. Yeah. Now, in the very first episode, the new Dukes have to take on a menace worthy of Knight Rider called the Mean Green Machine. In one scene, this tank-like vehicle, named after my favorite toy a few years earlier, that my sister took over, by the way. Uh, anyways, this green machine plowed through Enos's patrol car and knocked it clear to the side. Now, in the real world, this would have been the living, well, you know what, out of that police car. But the patrol car seems to have not been hit at all as Enos and Cletus engage in hot pursuit. I found something a little off at the big final battle between the Dukes and the green machine. Now notice that the General Lee is chasing after the Green Machine. They're barreling down the road. Well, Cole and Vance come up with a plan involving dynamite, naturally. The Dukes come up with the idea of jumping over the Green Machine and dropping the dynamite on top of it. Now, the stunt in itself is pretty awesome, but there is a little bit of a continuity problem here. See, I just happened to notice when the General Lee takes off, it's no longer on the road, it's on the dirt. And when it leaps up over the green machine, it appears like the green machine is not driving down the road anymore. It's completely standing still. So what happened? 
We went from chasing it down the road to suddenly it's completely still so that the general could easily jump over and drop the dynamite on top of it. I shouldn't say easily. I mean, like I said before, this is a pretty awesome stunt. I mean, I wouldn't do it. Now, I don't know if it was just my imagination, but it seemed like in this season, they were a little bit more careful about the camera angles to uh, sort of prevent some of the uh, indications of damage to the General Lee, but they were still there from time to time. Of course, we all know that the General Lee could heal itself. Like this episode where the General Lee actually healed itself as it went around the corner. That fast. See what I mean? Now, in the intro to the series this year, it shows the Green Machine General Lee leap causing damage to the car, but then it's okay in the scene in the actual episode, which is probably just more proof the General can indeed heal itself rather quickly. Like in this scene, Roscoe may be pounding the General Lee to smithereens, but it won't matter because the General will be brand new in just a couple of seconds. You watch. Except now he's mad. In the episode Vance's Lady, Roscoe has a pretty close call. Well, closer than usual. What a horrendous crash. Good. This car accident was so close it chopped the top of Roscoe's hat off. Now how did Roscoe get the top of his hat cut like that when he was ducked down the whole time? <laughs> this next goof comes from a funny Roscoe and Ina scene in the episode A Little Game of Pool. As Roscoe and Enos drive through the fence, check out the distance between the two cars. Now, if I didn't know any better, I'd think those two cars got a lot closer together, wouldn't you? Now, Roscoe and Enos don't know yet, but they have disturbed the home of a big old bull. Say, is this some kind of magic bull? How did he get between those two cars? Remember how close they were together? You know, I kind of have a feeling like Roscoe and Enos used stunt doubles for this particular scene. What do you think? In the episode, Coy vs. Vance, Coy is riding a motorcycle next to the General Lee. Now check out his front wheel, as it doesn't appear to be spinning at all, and yet he is still keeping up with the General Lee. Hmm. You know, in all the TV shows I've watched that had goofs, it seems like sometimes the best episodes are the ones with the most goofs. In this same episode, we had this amazing stunt. Now in the episode, Welcome Back, Bo and Luke. It was the final episode of Christopher Mayer and Byron Cherry as Vance and Coy in the series. And all they appeared in 19 episodes and 13 episodes of the cartoon version of the Dukes on Saturday morning. Now as glad as I was back then to see Bo and Luke return, I have to say the biggest goof of all is how the show treated Vance and Coy. They left early in the return episode of Bo and Luke and were never seen again. They never even appeared on the reunion movies. I don't know if they were ever asked or not, of course, but you have to wonder. What a missed opportunity to have a major Dukes team up. To beat all, Coy and Vance were kicked off the cartoon series as well and replaced, replaced by, uh, of course, Bo and Luke, Schneider, and Wopat. Now, Coy and Vance had the deck stacked against them, and I just think it would have been a decent thing to have given them a bit more of a send-off and a couple of return episodes or at least uh, let them keep the cartoon series since they started it. If you ever pointed this out to me in the comments, John Schneider is friends with uh, Byron Cherry. Schneider actually had Byron Cherry on a few of his movies, Poker Run, Stand On It, and Christmas Cars, where he played Cousin Coy. This next scoop from the episode Daisy's Shotgun Wedding involves a hilarious fight scene between Bo Duke and future Night Court star Richard Mall, aka Bull. Maul's character named Milo and his family are trying to force Daisy to marry him, which leads the Duke boys, of course, to come in for a rescue from the air using hang gliders. Notice there's no sign of anybody around other than the family, the preacher, and the Duke boys. Well, Luke has his hands full while Bo is fighting Maul, I mean uh, Milo. Eventually, Luke does come to help him out. Did you happen to see the ghosts that apparently were watching? Keep your eyes to the right. I've slowed it down just a bit. Now, when I first saw these people, I about had a heart attack. 
There's probably a logical explanation as to who these people are or what they're doing besides being ghosts. It's just that I, I guess I have a vivid imagination. Now let's go back to 1983 and check out the Duke's animated series. A fun spinoff of the live action Dukes of Hazzard TV series that was a top 10 smash up until John Schneider and Tom Wopat went on strike that is. The cartoon had a storyline that never ended, filled with a few mind-blowing goofs and mysteries no one ever bothered to solve, or at least attempt to explain on the show. The Duke boys and Daisy are on a race around the world to earn prize money to save the farm. And Boss Hogg and Roscoe are racing against him, so Boss can foreclose in the farm and win the prize money. But who is giving the prize money? There's no other racers and there's no mention of exactly who is sponsoring the race. Was it just a bet between the Dukes and Boss Hogg? That can't be, really. I mean, the Dukes had no money. They needed the prize money just to save the farm. And then there's the mysterious disappearance of Coy and Vance Duke, voiced by the live-action TV Dukes at the time, Byron Cherry and Christopher Mayer. In 1983, when this cartoon came out, John Schneider and Tom Wopat were on strike for a bigger cut in all the profits the Dukes of Hazzard was generating. You know, all the toys, lunch boxes, posters, etc, etc. You know, as understandable as that might be, you know their leaving actually hurt the show to the point it most likely killed most of the profits that they were trying to take part in. No. Too bad they all couldn't come to an agreement, but no. that's another topic for another day. At any rate, Coy and Vance were the dukes of the show at the time. Now, I hadn't seen this cartoon since I was a kid. I just recently bought the DVD set, and so I guess this was like the second time I watched it. The biggest laughs I got came from Boss and Roscoe, voiced by Sorrel Book and James Best. They brought the same hilarious fun they had on the live action series to, to the cartoon and, and then some. The nerve of them dukes sneaking up on us fair and square like that. Oh, hush. Uh, what's your firecracker for, Boss? It's the 4th of July, right? It's the middle of the winter, you dipstick. You digit. You know what you are? You're another Scrooge. You even sound like your name was Scrooge, and my name was Bob Scratchit. You mean Bob Cratchit? Him too. But back to the Du Boys. They just up and disappeared in season two after Bo and Luke came back to the live action series. At least on there, we had an explanation. We saw the old Dukes arrive in town and Coy and Vance take off out of town. But in the cartoon, they were in the middle of a worldwide race. Right in the middle of it, and Coy and Vance just magically become Bo and Luke. I know they thought kids don't usually pay attention to plot details, but if two people magically become two other people, then kids notice. Believe me. I mean, I did. They could have said something, just some kind of explanation, but nope, nothing. To make matters worse, the start of the race is depicted in a new intro in the second season, and as the race starts, we see a sign that says, Good luck to Bo, Luke, and Daisy. Did we start a new race? Is that the explanation? Then who won the last race? And if the Dukes won that race, the farm should be okay now, right? And if Boss won the last race, then Uncle Jesse would be homeless or paying extremely high rent to Boss. And as much fun as this show was at times, again, mostly thanks to Roscoe and Boss Hogg, it would have been really nice to have an ending of some sort. But no, the race never ended officially. In fact, in one episode, it looked like it might be getting near the end as they were released in America in the second to last episode when the Dukes were in Hollywood, but then they ended up in the Philippines on the last episode. Now, how do you drive from Hollywood to the Philippines anyway? You know, there ought to be a law for television. If you star a story, you have to end the story with one final episode. Well, at least the Dukes made me laugh, and the ending was less consequential because as the live-action series was still on, as a kid, you might automatically assume the Dukes won the race and kept the farm, but most series don't have another version of themselves to fall back on. Jump a gee, Hossafat, it's a hornet's nest! <laughs> In the episode, tells of the Vienna Hoods. Bo and Luke have replaced Coy and Vance, of course, in this season, but who keeps replacing them? Just in case you forgot, here's how they normally sound. Let's make a break for it. You got it. There's these strange voices coming out of Bo and Luke that aren't them. I wonder what those fellas are looking for. 
This episode was worse than the Super Friends for Voice Goose. Maybe my transmission slipping. You're right, Daisy. Who's gonna pay to see a band with fellas that old? What do you think's going on? Beats me, but we better get out of here. So that's why those fellas were following us. They were after Cindy Sue. It'd be nice to go see some entertainment Saturday night if them famous musician fellers is playing anywhere near town. We gotta work our way back to General Lee and then light the heck on out of here. Oh, I, I gotta warn you about the theme song. If, if you listen to it too much, it'll get stuck in your head and you'll never get it out. I mean, never. And, and it plays in my head right now. Oh, Uncle Jesse, played by Denver Powell, was on the series as well. He was such a good actor. I love seeing him on reruns of Andy Griffith as Briscoe Darling, which is awfully close to Roscoe, isn't it? Just a little bit. I never thought of that before. And then there was this, uh, there was this role as Mad Jack, the mountain man on the life and times of Grizzly Adams. I loved that show as a kid. You remember it was a series about the, uh, I guess, the frontiersman with the uh, giant bear as a pet? Of course, uh, he was in way too many things to list. Uncle Jesse would read Daisy's letter. He'd get every week detailing the Duke's adventures to a new character, an animated raccoon named Smokey. Sure, I'll read Daisy's postcard. It's funny, though. The Duke's Farm didn't look nothing like the main TV series. The Duke's Hazard was, uh, house was always wide in the series, but in the cartoon, it looked more like Uncle Jed's cabin from the Beverly Hillbillies, before he struck oil, that is. Other notable additional voices from Saturday Morning's past included Michael Bell, John Stevenson, Bob Holt, just to name a few. Michael Bell was Bruce Banner on the uh, 80's Hulk cartoon. He was on a lot of other stuff you probably remember like the Super Friends. Coincidentally Bob Holt was the actual voice of the Incredible Hulk on that 80's cartoon. I did a video about that if you'd like to check it out. And of course Scooby-Doo's Fred Jones and current Scooby-Doo voice Frank Welker was the voice of Roscoe's dog Flash who in this version is wearing a hat. You know, the more research I do on cartoons, the more I realize that Welker is on everything. I begin to think he surpassed Mel Blanc in number of series and characters that he's voiced. Uh, I just did a video recently on Wonderbug, and there he was, the voice of Wonderbug's alter ego, Schlepgar. He just keeps popping up. All in all, there were only 20 episodes made of the Dukes. The cartoon, that is. You can get the whole series on DVD at Amazon if you get the nostalgic bug and want to relive part of your childhood. Like I said, don't get too invested in the story, but you know, you'll love Roscoe and, and Boss Hogg's antics. It's, it's hilarious. And the stories, you know, individual stories are pretty interesting. It's just the fact that the main story, the race, that never concludes. I enjoyed the episodes uh, the most where they took the most advantage of being a cartoon and integrated more fantastic elements like the episodes with leprechauns. But he's the bad one. This one's too stupid to think for himself. Well, thank you. I appreciate the good word. Did you? It's Loch Ness Monster, the Christmas Carol Ghost, a genie. It seemed a little bit of a waste to deal with more realistic stories that could have been taken straight from the main series, you know, like this one story about a crooked horse race or the Dukes get thrown in jail for the umpteenth time and have to catch the real crooks. I just think they should have uh, wholeheartedly embraced the fact that this was a cartoon series and took complete advantage of that fact. And one other thing, should Roscoe have been wearing his uniform outside of Hazard County other than for, well, character identification, I suppose. I have to be honest though, I really did enjoy watching this series again. This series was fun, despite all the goofs and piles. It's always fun going back in time, I guess, reliving your childhood. And what's your hurry? Stay a while and check out my channel for all kinds of classic TV stuff, especially fun TV superhero shows from back when television was fun. If you like cartoons, check out my other family-friendly uh, animated channel, Freddy Cat Cartoons. On one of my latest videos, my cartoon cat Claw takes a visit to the Ark Encounter in uh, Kentucky. If you've ever thought about visiting there, you might be interested in that one. Well, thanks for watching. Please comment. Let me know what you thought or what you'd like to see in the future. Please hit the like so YouTube will show this video to more people. Subscribe if you haven't, and uh, have a great day. Oh, goody, goody, go, bro. Sick it.